Wednesday, July 24th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pledges in a scathing speech to Congress to achieve total victory against Hamas and criticizes American opponents of his war in Gaza as idiots. His combative stance comes in a visit the Biden administration hoped can yield progress in negotiations to end the fighting. But in Netanyahu's speech today, there was scant evidence that what he either wants or will allow to happen. Thousands of protesters against the war in Gaza converge on Washington to condemn Netanyahu's visit, chanting free, free Palestine as they march towards the capital before police deploy pepper spray on some in the crowd. Vice President Kamala Harris tells members of the historically black sorority, sorority Zeta Phi Beta, that we are not playing around and asked for their support in November. Voters in Indiana have backed a Democratic presidential candidate in nearly 16 years, but the biennial meeting of roughly 6,000 people, mostly women, is part of a constituency Harris hopes will turn out for her in massive numbers in November, women of color. Insisting that the defense of democracy is more important than any title, President Joe Biden explains in an Oval Office address tonight his decision to drop his bid for re-election and to throw his support behind Vice President Kamala Harris. According to sources, former President Donald Trump plans to stop holding outdoor rallies like the one where he was shot during an assassination attempt this month in Butler, Pennsylvania. And driven by oceans that won't cool down, an unseasonably warm Antarctica and worsening climate change, Earth's record hot streak ramps up this week, making Sunday and then Monday the hottest days that humans have ever measured. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today delivered a full-throated defense of Israel's more than nine-month war in Gaza in an address to a joint session of Congress. Netanyahu repeated his pledge that Israel would keep fighting until it destroys Hamas. As thousands rallied outside the capital, the Israeli leader described U.S. protesters of Israel's war as Iran's useful idiots. A rough count showed more than 100 lawmakers boycotted Netanyahu's address. Rashida Tlaib, the only Palestinian-American lawmaker, did attend. She held a placard with the words war criminal on one side and guilty of genocide on the other side. KPFA's Eileen Alfandiri filed this report. And my friends, I came to assure you today of one thing. We will win. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu delivered a defiant speech to a joint session of Congress. In the face of international and domestic pressure to negotiate a ceasefire, Netanyahu said the war in Gaza could end tomorrow if Hamas surrenders, disarms, and returns all the hostages. But if they don't, Israel will fight until we destroy Hamas's military capabilities, end its rule in Gaza, and bring all our hostages home. That's what total victory means, and we will settle for nothing less. Netanyahu denounced the International Criminal Court. Its prosecutor is seeking an arrest warrant for him, the Israeli defense minister, and three Hamas leaders. The warrants have not yet been granted. Netanyahu also attacked U.S. activists protesting Israel's war in Gaza, charging they are dupes of Iran. Well, I have a message for these protesters. When the tyrants of Tehran, who hang gays from cranes and murder women for not covering their hair, 
are praising, promoting, and funding you, you have officially become Iran's useful idiots. The nearly hour-long speech was Netanyahu's fourth before a joint session of Congress. Dozens of lawmakers have boycotted his speeches before, but Axios reported its headcount showed this time a larger number. About half of Democrats in both the House and Senate stayed away. Most significantly, Vice President Kamala Harris, who otherwise would have helped preside over the joint session, chose instead to stick to her campaign schedule. She is to meet separately with Netanyahu, as is President Biden. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she would not attend the address. Other California Democrats who said they would boycott were Barbara Lee, Jared Huffman, Ro Khanna, Ami Berra, and Sarah Jacobs. Earlier in the morning, Jamal Bowman of New York slammed the congressional invitation to Netanyahu. We have invited Benjamin Netanyahu, who is being charged with war crimes, to address this house. Are we a democracy for all? Are we a democracy Gentleman's that time leads has expired. with our humanity? For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek Netanyahu? The only Palestinian-American lawmaker, Rashida Tlaib, did attend, wearing the Palestinian scarf, the keffiyeh. She held a placard that said, war criminal on one side and guilty of genocide on the other. In a statement Tuesday, Tlaib called the invitation to Netanyahu disgraceful and said he should be arrested and sent to the International Criminal Court. House Speaker Mike Johnson had warned there would be zero tolerance for any disruptions. Security officials removed protesters in the gallery who rose to display T-shirts with slogans demanding an end to the war and the freeing of remaining hostages. Looking to the future, Netanyahu thanked President Biden and the U.S. for their support of Israel, but also asked the U.S. to fast-track more military aid beyond the billions it has already sent. Former President Trump said on Truth Social he will meet with Netanyahu on Friday at Mar-a-Lago. It will be their first meeting since Trump said of the Israeli leader in 2021, quote, F him. Trump was angry when Netanyahu congratulated Biden over his presidential victory. Netanyahu has tried to smooth over relations with Trump. In his congressional address, Netanyahu denounced the assassination attempt and praised Trump for his pro-Israel actions as president. I also want to thank President Trump for all the things he did for Israel, from recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights to confronting Iran's aggression to recognizing Jerusalem as our capital and moving the American embassy there. A member of Netanyahu's far-right coalition government, National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir, went even further. And what the Times of Israel called a highly irregular move, Ben-Gavir endorsed Trump's presidential bid. The Times of Israel also said Ben Gavir reportedly told other government ministers that a hostage ceasefire deal with Hamas should be delayed because implementing it would be advantageous for the Democrats and detrimental to Trump in the November election. I'm Eileen Alfandari for KPFA News. Thousands of protesters against the war in Gaza converged on Washington today to condemn Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit, chanting Free Free Palestine as they marched toward the capital before police deployed pepper spray on some of the crowd. The demonstrators calling for an end of the war that's killed more than 39,000 Palestinians filled several blocks as they weaved through the streets of the nation's capital, carrying Palestinian flags and signs with messages such as arrest Netanyahu and end all U.S. aid to Israel. Outside Washington's Union Station, protesters removed American flags and hoisted Palestinian ones in their place to massive cheers in the crowd. BB, BB, we're not done. The Intifada has just begun, protesters shouted, referring to Netanyahu by his nickname. Netanyahu, you can't hide, you're committing genocide, other protesters shouted. Throngs of demonstrators rallied near the Capitol before starting their march ahead of Netanyahu's address to Congress, but police blocked them from getting close to the building. Police said they used pepper spray after some protesters became violent and failed to obey orders to move back from the police line. 
Before Netanyahu's speech, some protesters tried to block his route to the Capitol, but were removed from the street by police. After being turned away by officers near the Capitol, protesters wound through the Capitol Hill neighborhood for several blocks before gathering in front of the nearby rail station. KFA's Audie McAfee has more. It was Netanyahu's fourth address to the U.S. Congress as Israeli Prime Minister. He's calling full U.S. backing for his fight against Hamas and other Iran-backed groups. Thousands of demonstrators filled several blocks protesting his address as they carried Palestinian flags and signed that called for the arrest of the Prime Minister. Police blocked protesters from getting too close to the Capitol building and even sprayed some with pepper spray. Rama Ali Kassad is a member of the Palestinian Community Network. She addressed a large crowd at the rally. criminals, to remind these butchers, to remind these cowards, your days in power are numbered. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, more than 39,000 Palestinians have been killed in the war. A day before Netanyahu's speech, protesters attempted a sit-in at the Cannon Building, which houses congressional offices. According to the Capitol Police, about 200 people were arrested. Aya Ziada is a member of the group American Muslims for Palestine. She says people need to do more than talk to accomplish a ceasefire. We must channel our outrage into action. It's not enough to condemn these actions with words. We must demand that our leaders uphold international law and human rights, no matter how tiring it may become for us. The occupation and apartheid must end. More than 50 Democratic lawmakers boycotted Netanyahu's speech, citing concerns over the high civilian casualty figures in Gaza. Michigan Representative Rashida Tlaib is the only Palestinian-American in Congress. She showed up at the speech dressed in a keffiyeh, or traditional Palestinian scarf, and held a sign that read war criminal as Netanyahu spoke. March organizer Leanne Filan is with the Answer Coalition. She said her group and others will continue to speak out until the war is over. We will continue building this movement. We will continue building our forces. We will march today, and we will continue organizing and marching because we know that the historical place for us to be is the ones who are determining our own future. And that future has no place for genocide and has all the room for the Palestinian people's sovereignty and freedom and self-determination. Officials from Egypt, Israel, the United States, and Qatar are scheduled to meet in Doha, Qatar on Thursday to resume talks over a proposed three-phase ceasefire to end the war and free the remaining hostages. For KPFA News, I'm Adi McAfee. Activists around the country held protesters today of Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to Washington and to address a joint session of Congress and to meet with President Biden and other American leaders. In downtown San Francisco, Code Pink and other groups protested outside the offices of California's two U.S. senators. KPFA's Atta Shaheen was there and has filed this report. Stop the killing, stop the slaughter. Gaza has no food or water. Gaza has no food. Several dozen protesters gathered outside the office of Senator LaFonza Butler. One of them wore prison stripes and a mask of Netanyahu, while others dressed in international criminal court robes placed him behind bars. Lead organizer Cynthia Papermaster has been with the activist group Code Pink for 16 years. I've never felt this bad about anything because it's hard to live with what's going on. I mean, just day-to-day living, uh, I can't stand it. It's really unbearable. The group then marched to the office of California's other senator, Alex Padilla. They did so while carrying 46 names belonging to children under the age of 10 killed by Israel over the past several months. The names were arranged on a long red banner or red line. Biden announced that he, he, his red line would be the invasion of Rafa, if we remember, from a couple of months ago. And the invasion happened, and it continues. And uh, where is Biden's red line? Where is Senator Padilla's red line? Senator Butler, uh, Representative Nancy Pelosi, where is their red line? So we have to create our own red line. I guess we have to be the red line. Activists say Padilla's office failed to respond to a request for an appointment but members said they were determined to get their message across. 
Members of Code Pink tried to enter the Bush Street building housing Padilla's San Francisco office. They were hoping to speak with the local Padilla representative. But when building security barred entry, 71-year-old Tarnal Abbott collapsed onto the floor beside the doorway. Within a matter of minutes, emergency medical personnel had responded. So, you are laying here, and you said that you're willingly laying here. It's not because uh, of any medical emergency. Is that correct? I'm laying here because I can't, I'm so upset. I can't do anything else. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, it's not a physical emergency you're having or a medical emergency that you're having? It's a broken heart. Okay. And you do not wish to go to the hospital, correct? I don't think that the surgeons can fix a broken heart. She said despite being medically all right, she simply could not get up and there was no way she was going to ride in an ambulance. Yes, I've repeatedly said that I want the ambulance to go to Gaza where it's most needed. I'm an old lady. It's okay if I die because I'm upset about what's going on in Gaza. It is not okay that children die. A little poke in your middle finger, okay? You have to get that little sample of blood. The medical personnel ran a few tests on Abbott before eventually leaving. That, uh, yeah. There is a risk you think you could die, okay? Yeah. I know it feels, feels really drastic, but we just have to inform you of these things, okay? It's not drastic compared to what is going on in Palestine. Understood. Understood. Tarnal Abbott embraced her fellow organizers after finally getting up. We all have to do this together. Everybody has to do this together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Code Pink organizers say they'll keep doing whatever it takes, including putting their bodies on the line, to bring an end to the war in Gaza. In San Francisco, Ata Shaheen, KPFA News. Some of the families of Israeli hostages being held by Hamas asked U.S. lawmakers in Washington today to push for a deal to release their loved ones. The appeal came before Netanyahu's address to a joint session of Congress. Maya Roman had two family members kidnapped during the October 7th Hamas attack on southern Israel. One of them is still in custody. Roman said that Prime Minister Netanyahu should be prioritizing a deal that would lead to the release of the hostages. After all the death and destruction, after so many lives lost on both sides, after almost 300 days, a deal is within our grasp, and any delay might make things shift again and cost more lives on both sides. A deal requires both sides to be willing to sign it, the Israeli government and the heads of Hamas. It requires that both actors feel pressured. Efrat Machikawa has two family members among the 120 hostages believed still being held in Gaza. She said that more than 70 percent of the Israeli people want an end to the war in Gaza and the hostages brought home. We citizens of the free world who share values of freedom, democracy, solidarity must stand together against evil forces to ensure the return of the hostages so a healing process for the entire region of the Middle East will be able to sprout and hopefully grow. Zahiro Saha Moore's 79-year-old uncle is one of the hostages in Gaza. He said Netanyahu is more interested in his own political survival and position in Israel than he is in the lives of the hostages. Please don't be fooled by his seemingly decisive rhetoric, his voice manipulation he practices so well, and his hollow words aimed at getting a standing ovation no matter what. The image betrays the essence. The rhetoric is aimed at silencing the hostages' voices. More than 50 Democratic lawmakers chose to meet with the family members of the hostages today instead of attending Netanyahu's address, including Democratic representatives James Clyburn of South Carolina, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, and Jamie Raskin of Maryland, among others. Hamas took more than 220 hostages on October 7th. More than 100 have since been released. 120 remain captive Today marked their 291st day in captivity. Israel's national anthem was loudly jeered before its soccer team kicked off play at the Paris Olympics against Mali tonight. The game began with a massive security presence outside the stadium amid an increasingly strained international climate that has Paris's safety efforts squarely in the spotlight. 
The Israeli team arrived under a heavy police escort with motorbike riders at the front and around a dozen riot police vans following behind. Armed police officers patrolled the stadium, one with a rifle resting on his shoulder. Mali fans sang proudly when their national anthem was played first. When it came to Israel's anthem, boos and whistles immediately rang out. The stadium speaker system playing the anthems then got notably louder in what seemed like an effort to drown out the jeers. Once play began, Israeli players were booed each time they touched the ball. Security officials intervened in what appeared to be a heated argument in the stands between some fans. The commotion was near where one woman was holding a Palestinian flag. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Driven by oceans that will not cool down and unseasonably warm Antarctica and worsening climate change, Earth's record hot streak ramped up this week, making Sunday and then Monday the hottest days humans have ever measured. And according to the European Climate Service, Copernicus, there's a good chance that when the data comes in for yesterday, it will be three straight days of global record-breaking heat. Donna Warder reports. Provisional satellite data published by the European Climate Change Service, Copernicus, shows that Monday was the hottest day ever recorded, beating the previous day's record by 0.1 degree Fahrenheit, or 0.06 degrees Celsius. That's a temperature of 62.24 degrees Fahrenheit, or 17.15 degrees Celsius. Climate scientists say the world is now as warm as it was 125,000 years ago because of human-caused climate change. Copernicus says that while 2024 has been extremely warm, a warmer-than-usual Antarctic winter kicked this week into new territory. The former head of United Nations climate negotiations, Christiana Figueres, says we all scorch and fry if the world doesn't immediately change course. I'm Donna Warder. A group of Democratic lawmakers and climate activists gathered in front of the U.S. Capitol building to talk about legislative efforts to hold fossil fuel companies financially accountable for the effects of climate change. Democratic lawmakers and climate advocates said that the Republicans' Project 2025 list of policy proposals, if Donald Trump wins the presidency, would give the fossil fuel industry a free hand to keep releasing carbon emissions, which are responsible for climate change. Florida Democratic Representative Kathy Castor said that the recent heat waves that have been broiling much of the country this summer are a direct result of heat-trapping carbon emissions, and Project 2025 would create more of them. Americans are waking up to Project 2025, Trump's Project 25, and they don't like it because it's going to cost them more. If you believe in clean air and clean water, if you believe clean air and clean water are fundamental to a healthy and productive life, I urge you to join us in standing up to make polluters pay. Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts said that 15 of the largest fuel, fossil fuel companies made over $170 billion in profits last year. Democratic lawmakers touted the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which, among other things, funds renewable energy projects. Hawaii Senator Brian Schatz called for more legislation like that to move the needle on a renewable energy future challenge of our generation, of their generation, and of every generation that is living right now. It is our responsibility to solve this problem, but more specifically, it is the legal, moral, and political responsibility of polluters to clean up their mess. Experts say global warming led to record-breaking heat in 2023. Climate scientists say human activity responsible for most of it. Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland said more legislative action is needed immediately to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Every day we are experiencing the ravages of the climate crisis. 
uh, across the globe uh, in my state of Maryland, in the coastal communities of the Chesapeake Bay and the Eastern Shore, rising uh, waters, uh, more flooding uh, in Western Maryland, uh, drought, uh, near drought conditions. Uh, we are seeing Mother Earth scream out every day uh, to tell us that enough is enough. Massachusetts Senator Markey co-authored a letter urging the Department of Energy to consider the negative environmental effects of liquefied natural gas exports and their impact on gasoline prices. Democrats and climate activists called for the fossil fuel industry as the biggest driver of climate change to pay more for climate mitigation efforts, with the biggest contributors to pollution paying the most. Environmentalists say that the Inflation Reduction Act has helped fund clean energy solutions that have saved American taxpayers money and created more than 300,000 clean energy jobs. Climate activists delayed flights at Germany's main airport in a protest of fossil fuels. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. Several protesters glued themselves to the runway at Cologne Bonn International Airport early Wednesday, causing flight disruptions for several hours. After being removed by police, the group, called Last Generation, released a statement saying travellers can expect similar delays in coming weeks, not just in Europe, but globally. The group is known for its headline-grabbing acts of protest in support of cutting fossil fuels, having previously sprayed Brandenburg Gate with orange paint and thrown mashed potato mm -hmm. over a priceless Monet watercolour painting. Trent Murray, Berlin. A federal appeals court is allowing a Biden administration rule aimed at limiting planet-warming pollution from coal-fired power plants to remain in place as legal challenges to strike it down continue. Industry groups and Republican-led states, including West Virginia, had asked the court to block the Environmental Protection Agency rule on an emergency basis, saying it was unattainable and threatened reliability of the nation's power grid. The EPA rule would force many coal-fired power plants to capture 90 percent of their carbon emissions or close within eight years. A three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit said that industry groups had not shown they're likely to su succeed on the merits of their case. A new analysis of climate pollution from the U.S. economy shows the country could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by anywhere from 38 percent to 56 percent over the coming decade. As clean energy sources get cheaper— and federal climate policies take full effect. Rhodium, a independent research firm that specializes in energy and climate issues, forecasts that for the rate of U.S. emission reductions to increase each year by 2 to 4 percent, even as the economy and the demand for energy both grow. The prediction comes in the group's new stake Taking Stock report. The 10th annual forecast of U.S. emissions from power generation, transportation, industry, and other major carbon pollution sources. Sally Patterson has more. The U.S. is aiming to reduce its emissions by at least 50 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Analysis from Rhodium, which tracks climate progress, though, suggests gas emissions will only fall 32 to 43 percent in the next six years. But the report says policies under President Joe Biden have significantly driven emissions down, particularly the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Rhodium spokesperson Ben King told media the past few years have been an inflection point in climate policy, saying this is where clean energy went mainstream. The researchers note that what happens in November's election and who ends up in the Oval Office could determine American success in weeding off greenhouse gases for good. That's Sally Patterson reporting. Two separate wildfires burning in Plumas County have combined to form one big fire that continues to burn out of control, causing thousands to be evacuated. KPFA's Ian Chen has more. 
In Plumas National Forest in Northern California, the Gold Complex fire has burned over 2,800 acres and had not been contained as of Wednesday morning. The Gold Complex fire resulted from the combination of two separate fires: the Mill Fire, which burns near White Hawk Range, and the Smith Fire, burning north of California State Highway 70 between Smith Peak and the community of Maybe. Chandler P is a deputy sheriff in Plumas County. He says most of the Smith fire has been brought under control, as more than 400 firefighters have been dispatched to the Mill Fire area.、Uh, they were able to get the Smith fire contained.、Um, it's not 100% out yet, but they have it contained at this point. The Mill fire or the Gold fire, it is currently at about 2,800 acres. There's 451 fire personnel on site. Uh, dealing with some spot fires, and a lot of hand crews and water tenders working the edges. An evacuation shelter has been set up at Quincy High School. Animals in need of shelter can be taken to the Plumas Sierra County Fairgrounds in Quincy. WDP says around 6,200 residents in the affected areas, including Gold Mountain, Iron Horse, and South Portola, have been evacuated. Adrian Freeman is a spokesperson for the U.S. Forest Service. She says firefighters have made progress in building a containment line around the fire, but because of potentially strong winds, it is still unclear when the fire will be contained. In general,、um, when you see convective activity, activity over a fire area, what that can do is cause the winds to be erratic and sometimes strong. Which means it's really hard to predict where the fire is going to spread. So that's something that we're we do have a lot of line. We have a lot of people working. We have a ton of equipment, but we're going to wait to talk about containment until we're confident that those lines are going to hold. Freeman says they're also expecting thunder and lightning activity in the area, which can make it more difficult to contain the fire in the heavily wooded area. Updates on the fire are available on the Plumas National Forest Facebook page. For KPFA News, I'm Yuen Chen. Wildfires are blazing across western U.S. and Canada, prompting thousands to evacuate, shutting down highways, and fouling the air quality over several states. In the U.S., wildfires are raging in Oregon, Washington, and California, illuminating skies with bright orange flames and haze. Reporter Julie Walker with details. California, Washington, Oregon—all states where firefighters are busy combating several blazes with evacuations underway. Parts of I-84 in Oregon shut down after the Durkee fire was so intense it created its own weather pattern, according to National Weather Service meteorologist Josh Smith. They've generated a lot of heat, which has helped、uh, help them control. Their own environment. He says a heat wave is gripping the region. At least eight or nine days of a、uh, hundred degree temperatures or greater. Triple digit temperatures also making it difficult for firefighters in California. In Sierra, on the Nevada border, a series of lightning sparked wildfires, closing a state highway. And in Riverside, officials searching for whoever set off fireworks, causing a massive blaze there. I'm Julie Walker. A lawsuit filed today accuses the California Fair Plan—that's the state's backup home insurance provider—of selling inadequate policies for years to hundreds of thousands of residents. The suit says the policies allow the insurer to increase profits by illegally denying, in part or in full, hundreds of claims related to fire damage. The Fair Plan is a state-created insurer that's funded by insurance companies, not taxpayers. It provides Californians with a way to get fire coverage when they can't find it otherwise. At the end of June, it insured more than 400,000 homes, making it one of the largest in the state. A spokesman for the Fair Plan declined to comment on the lawsuit. In recent years, it's seen exponential growth as California's insurance market has crumbled. Companies have pulled back business in the state in response to inflation, increased risks due to climate change, and losses caused by catastrophic wildfires. Multiple wildfires in the Canadian Rockies' largest national park. 
sent up to 25,000 visitors and residents fleeing west over the last open mountain road, navigating through darkness and soot following a government alert during the area's busiest tourist time of the year. Norman Hall reports. As many as 25,000 visitors have had to leave Edmonton's Jasper National Park in the nearby town of Jasper. One resident said by phone that she was stuck in wall-to-wall traffic fleeing west over the last open mountain road. The fire also prompted an unusual order to make a vast U-turn east. Hundreds of wildfires are burning in western Canada. A record number of wildfires last year forced hundreds of thousands of evacuations and sent thick smoke far below the border, leading to hazy skies and health advisories in multiple U.S. cities. I, Norman Hall. Vice President and now presidential hopeful Kamala Harris is making a pitch for support from historically black sororities and universities. Harris gave a speech at the annual meeting of Zeta Phi Beta in Indianapolis today, where she told the sorority sisters the United States is counting on them to register people to vote, get them to the polls, and to mobilize for the future of America. Christopher Martinez reports. Three days after launching her bid for the White House, Vice President Kamala Harris visited Indianapolis for the annual national meeting of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, Inc., one of the historically black sororities and fraternities that have been among Harris's staunchest supporters. Harris thanked them for helping elect Joe Biden president and her as the first woman vice president. And she praised the group as some of the most powerful advocates for justice in America. And now, in this moment... Our nation needs your leadership once again. In this moment, I believe we face a choice between two different visions for our nation, one focused on the future, the other focused on the past. That vision focused on the past is the plan for a second Donald Trump presidency, and in particular, the 900-page Project 2025, which Harris calls a plan to return America to a dark past. That plan includes, for example, proposals to eliminate the Department of Education, end Head Start, and more. Harris calls it an outright attack on our children, our families, and our future. Across our nation, we are witnessing a full-on assault on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights. The freedom to vote the freedom to be safe from gun violence, the freedom to live without fear of bigotry and hate, the freedom to love who you love openly and with pride, the freedom to learn and acknowledge our true and full history, and the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body and not have her government telling her what to do. Zeta Phi Beta is part of the so-called Divide Nine, a group of historically black sororities and fraternities, most of them founded by the children and grandchildren of formerly enslaved people. The group cannot officially endorse Harris, but shortly after Harris kicked off her campaign, presidents of the Divine Nine issued a joint statement promising an unprecedented voter registration, education, and mobilization coordinated campaign. As for Zeta Phi Beta, Harris told the sorority sisters America is counting on them, to register people to vote, to get them to the polls, to energize, organize, and mobilize. And we know when we organize, mountains move. When we mobilize, nations change. And when we vote, we make history. So let us continue to fight with optimism, with faith, and with hope. Because when we fight, we win. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. God bless you. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. FBI Director Christopher Wray said today that Donald Trump's would-be assassin searched for details of the John F. Kennedy assassination from his laptop and flew a drone in the area near the rally just two hours before the former president took the stage. 
The revelations, the latest details about the investigation to come to light this week, and congressional hearings about the Trump rally on July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. At the wide-ranging House Judiciary Committee hearing, Ray also shared that investigators believe that Thomas Matthew Crooks used a gun with a collapsible stock that made his identification as a threat more difficult and that he accessed the roof of the building that he shot from by climbing, not with a ladder. Sagar Magani reports. The FBI's chief is sharing new information about the Trump rally gunman. Director Chris Ray tells a House panel investigators probed a laptop tied to Thomas Matthew Crooks and, among other things, found a Google search from a week before the shooting. How far away was Oswald from Kennedy? Referring to Lee Harvey Oswald's killing of President Kennedy 61 years ago. Ray says investigators have found images from searches of news stories, things like pictures of prominent officials, but says that's not overly indicative of a motive. That could be just because he was reading news stories. Ray says the gunman also flew a drone roughly 200 yards from the rally stage before Trump spoke, viewing and live streaming the footage. That adds to questions about security lapses before the event. Sagar Magani, Washington. Former President Trump was to hold today his first campaign rally since President Biden dropped out of the race. Trump was expected to shift his focus at the North Carolina rally to his likely opponent in November, Vice President Kamala Harris. North Carolina is a swing state that Trump narrowly won in 2020. However, Democrats consider the state to be in play this November. Over the past few days, Trump has gone after Harris on social media posts and in interviews, saying she's more radical than Biden is. He's also gone after her on the same issues he attacked Biden, like security at the U.S.-Mexico border and on crime. He's also hedged on plans to debate Harris. He originally had agreed to a debate with Biden in September, hosted by ABC News, but has since said he'd rather... Fox News host the debate. According to two sources familiar with his campaign's operations, Trump plans to stop holding outdoor rallies like the one where he was shot during an assassination attempt this month in Butler, Pennsylvania. The sources said current plans are to hold indoor rallies, but they also say it's possible Trump will participate in smaller outdoor events or larger rallies and facilities where entrances are more fully controlled and there are not issues with high ground nearby, like stadiums. Jack Rudy Darve reports from Washington. Two sources have told NBC News Mr. Trump might still host smaller rallies outside, but for larger events he is looking at indoor venues or outdoor spaces where they can implement tighter security measures, as well as venues without nearby rooftops or other points of elevation, as was the case with the Pennsylvania rally. This comes after the Washington Post reported the Secret Service was advising the Trump campaign to avoid outdoor locations. They are instead scoping out places like basketball arenas, according to a source speaking to the Post. Neither the Trump campaign nor the Secret Service have commented on the reports. All this comes after the resignation of Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheatle following the assassination attempt and who said the agency had fallen short of its mission to protect our nation's leaders. Jack Rudy Darve reporting from Washington. Trump is appealing New York's civil fraud case and verdict that could bankrupt him. He's seeking to, and seeks to bar Trump and his company from doing business anymore in the state of New York. Trump's attorneys filed the appeal, arguing New York Attorney General Letitia James's lawsuit should have been promptly dismissed since the statute of limitations barred some of the allegations, since no one was harmed by Trump's fraud and that James's involvement in private business transactions threatens to drive businesses out of the state. Trump's lawyers contend that Judge Arthur Engeron's decision, if upheld, would bestow James with limitless power to target anyone she desires, including her self-described political opponents. 
Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon, now serving a four-month contempt of Congress federal prison term, faces another trial in December in New York connected to a charge of scamming donors who gave money to build a border wall with Mexico. He's pled not guilty to the charge. Bannon hasn't appeared in court because he's serving a sentence after being convicted of ignoring a subpoena to testify before this special committee that investigated the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Under the latest charges, prosecutors say Bannon helped funnel over $100,000 to a co-founder of the nonprofit We Build the Wall, Inc., who was getting a secret salary. Though Bannon and others had promised donors that every cent, every dollar, would be used to help construct the wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. President Biden addressed the nation from the Oval Office tonight for the first time since announcing he was withdrawal from the presidential race, talking about his accomplishments during his three and a half years in office and what he plans to do with the remaining six months as commander-in-chief. White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre with this remarks before Trump's speech tonight. The decision that he made on Sunday was about putting country first, was about his party, and was about the American people. Again, I would refer you to uh, what he's going to say tonight. He will lay that out, speak for himself, and you will hear directly from the American, from, from the president. More from reporter Sagar Magani at the White House. President Biden will address the nation in prime time to explain his decision to leave the race and make a case for his record. The president's legacy is very much on the ballot in November, even though his name is not, and how his single term is remembered will be intertwined with Kamala Harris's success. She is the first vice president to run for the White House since Al Gore, who distanced himself from Bill Clinton. Harris, though, is running tightly on the administration's achievements. Unmatched in modern history. Donald Trump and his allies are eager to tie Harris to the president's record, and not in a good way, calling her Biden 2.0 and singling out high inflation and border policies, among other things. Sagar Magani, Washington. In his speech tonight, President Biden framed his decision to step aside from the 2024 presidential race as a matter of saving democracy. I revere this office, he said, but I love my country more. That's what Biden said in the rare Oval Office speech that marked the beginning of the closing chapter of his presidency and his half century in public service. Biden said, it's been the honor of my life to serve as your president, but in defense of democracy, which is at stake and is more important than any title, I draw strength and I find joy in working for the American people. In under 48 hours, the head of the staunchly conservative public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention rankled fellow Baptists by applauding President Joe Biden's selfless act of withdrawing his candidacy for re-election. And then his agency reported he was fired. And now they have reaffirmed his leadership. The series of events started Sunday, but by yesterday morning, the SBC's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission announced that no leader, Brent Leatherwood, wasn't fired Rather, he has the full support of his top board members, although the board chair resigned amid the agency's retraction. Norman Hall explains. Brett Leatherwood, the head of the staunchly conservative public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, rankled fellow Baptists by applauding what he called President Joe Biden's selfless act of withdrawing his candidacy for re-election. Leatherwood's agency reported that he was fired and reaffirmed to his leadership within 48 hours. Executive Committee Chair Kevin Smith, a black pastor from Florida, accepts the blame and resigned both as chairman and as a board member. Smith raised eyebrows himself in 2022 by saying some Southern Baptists lost their minds over the election of a black president in Barack Obama. I'm Norman Hall. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org.
This music break is brought to you by Dead to the World with host Tim Lynch, which airs Wednesdays at 8 p.m. We now return to the Pacifica Evening News. Ukraine's top diplomat has told China's foreign minister that Kiev was open to negotiating with Russia, but only if Moscow is ready to do so in good faith. Foreign Minister Dmitro Kuleba is the highest-ranking Ukrainian official to travel to China since Russia's February 2022 invasion and held talks today with Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Reporter Megumi Lim in Kiev. The talks between Kuliba and Wang Yi, which took place in Guangzhou, southern China, lasted for more than three hours. According to a statement by Ukraine's foreign ministry, Kuliba told Wang Yi, a just peace in Ukraine is in China's strategic interests. He also briefed Wang Yi on the results of the peace summit in Switzerland and explained the importance of implementing Ukraine's peace formula as a just end to Russian aggression. Kuliba said Ukraine was ready to engage the Russian side in the negotiation process at a certain stage when Moscow was ready to negotiate in good faith. A statement by the Chinese foreign ministry acknowledged that the conditions and timing were not yet ripe, but China supported all efforts conducive to peace and was willing to play a constructive role in ceasefire and peace talks. That's Megumi Lim reporting. CrowdStrike, the cybersecurity firm that crashed millions of computers with a botched update all over the world last week, is offering its partners a $10 Uber Eats gift card as an apology. That's according to several people who say they received the gift card. The company has blamed a bug in an update that allowed its cybersecurity systems to push bad data out to millions of customer computers. That set off last week's global tech outage that grounded airplane flights, took TV broadcasts off the air, disrupted banks, hospitals, and retailers. CrowdStrike also outlined measures it would take to prevent the problem from repeating today, including staggering the rollout of such updates, giving customers more control over when and where they occur, and providing more details about the updates that it plans. The problem centered around an undetected error in the content configuration update for its Falcon platform affecting Windows machines that allowed problematic content data to be deployed to CrowdStrike's customers. More from reporter Julie Walker. CrowdStrike is blaming a bug in an update for allowing its cybersecurity systems to push bad data out to millions of customer computers, setting off last week's global tech outage that's still reverberating, especially in the airline industry. The company put a preliminary post-incident review online Wednesday explaining that a bug in the content validation system allowed what it calls problematic content data to go out to CrowdStrike's customers triggering an unexpected exception, crashing Windows operating systems. CrowdStrike had said it would take measures in the future to prevent similar outages. I'm Julie Walker. U.S. airline regulators have opened an investigation into Delta Airlines, which is still struggling to restore operations more than four full days after the computer crash around the world, the faulty software update causing that technological havoc worldwide and disrupting global air travel. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced the Delta investigation on the ex-social media platform to ensure the airline is following the law, taking care of its passengers during continued widespread disruptions. Ed Donahue has more. The Transportation Department is investigating Delta Airlines as it struggles to recover from a global technology outage. The outage began Thursday night into Friday morning, and most airlines have recovered from it. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says Delta is still canceling or delaying flights. More than half a million passengers have been impacted. Including people being on hold for hours and hours trying to get a new flight. Uh, people having to sleep on airport floors, even accounts of unaccompanied minors being stranded in airports, unable to get on a flight. Buttigieg says he has spoken to the airline CEO. Delta will live up to their passenger service commitments, including specific commitments that we secured 
from Delta in 2022 and are prepared to enforce. That includes free rebooking and to provide hotels and meals when there's a lengthy delay. The collapse at Delta is stunning for an outfit that was widely viewed as the best big U.S. airline. Ed Donahue, Washington. The Federal Trade Commission is launching an investigation into so-called surveillance pricing, seeking more information about how artificial intelligence is being used to change pricing rapidly based on data about customer behavior and characteristics. The FTC says the practice allows companies to charge different customers different prices. The agency is serving eight companies with a mandatory request for information. All the companies apparently advertise their artificial intelligence and other tech tools, along with a trove of customer information, to target prices to individual customers. Norman Hall reports. The FTC has ordered information from eight companies that the agency says offer products and services that use personal data to set prices based on a shopper's individual characteristics. The agency says it's seeking to better understand the opaque market of surveillance pricing practices using consumer data, including credit information, location, and browsing history, to charge different customers different prices for the same goods. The FTC said it sent orders to MasterCard, Revionics, Bloomreach, J.B. Morgan Chase, Task Software, Pros, Accenture, and McKinney and Company. I'm Norman Hall. The Federal Appeals Court has blocked the implementation of the Biden administration's student debt relief plan, which would have lowered monthly payments for millions of borrowers. In a ruling late last week, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals granted a request by a group of Republican-led states seeking to invalidate the administration's entire loan forgiveness program. The court's order prohibits the administration from implementing the parts of the SAVE plan that had not already been blocked by lower court rulings. A new study showing that being poor is bad for your health and money is at least a partial cure. Reporter Ed Donahue explains. A new study says more money could result in fewer trips to the emergency room. The study looked at close to 3,000 low-income people who applied for a lottery in Chelsea, Massachusetts, near Boston. More than half of them got up to $400 a month for close to a year. Researchers say those who got the money had 27% fewer visits to an emergency room compared to those who didn't get the payments. People in the study who got the money used the emergency room less for medical issues related to behavioral health and and substance use. There were no significant differences between the two groups in regular doctor visits or prescriptions. One of the researchers says there is a narrative out there that you give people cash, they spend it on drugs and alcohol. He says this is one of the first studies to really rigorously and emphatically show that's not the case. I'm Ed Donahue. Typhoon Gamey has made landfall in Taiwan's east coast, bringing gusts of wind around 150 miles an hour. It's expected to be the most powerful storm to hit the island in eight years. Laura Westbrook reports from Hong Kong. Wind and rain have gathered strength in Taiwan, and total rainfall could reach up to 1,800 millimeters during the typhoon. In preparation, some 2,000 people have been evacuated from mountain areas at risk of landslides. Soldiers are on standby. It's also affected the annual military exercises, known as the Han Kwan exercises, forcing Air Force drills to be cancelled. Laura Westbrook, Hong Kong. Partly cloudy skies around the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs near 70 degrees. Further inland, there will be a heat advisory with sunny skies and highs near 100 degrees. There is an excessive heat advisory for the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow in the city of Fresno. Sunny skies predicted with a high of 108 degrees. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, July 24th. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Hi, this is Alice Walker. In these difficult times, I can't imagine living in a world without KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Jeff Chang. For years, KPFA has been a beacon for all of us in times of political darkness and lack of hope. 
Let's stand with KPFA now. Please donate what you can today. Hi, folks. This is Rebecca Gordon. We're living through some pretty hard times these days, and I can't imagine doing it without KPFA. Please donate whatever you can today. Thank you. Donate today by calling 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.